Hello, welcome to the uh, San Francisco Bay Area ACM. Um, we are we have a seminar, and tonight um, we welcome our guest speaker, Steve Bachman. Uh, the topic: efficiently protecting software innovations on a global scale. Um, Steve has been a contributor to our chapter into the ACM for many years. Um, he is a native of the Bay Area and his firm is the Bachman Law Group. Um, and tonight uh, his topic is gonna be on um, the global aspects of uh, protecting uh, intellectual property. Um, and he'll um, uh, speak in terms of um, uh, state of the practice and, and how, it's actually, how things can actually be done. So um, welcome, Steve, we, we look forward to this talk. Um, a little bit about our chapter. The SF Bay ACM chapter was founded in 1957 um, and our purpose is to pro promote knowledge of modern computing. Um, we are also available for the community to support one another in terms of networking and hiring. Um, in order uh, for people to help us, we um, uh, encourage you to become annual members of the SF Bay ACM. It's only $20 a year. Um, and if you go to sfbayacm.org um, and click the join button, uh, it, it's uh, very easy to sign up. And we, again, welcome your support. Another way that um, you can help the chapter um, is if you have um, uh, the inclination to help out in various areas, such as um, our website content, uh, helping with our membership. Um, so, you know, if you have any interest, there's no obligation um, just to find out about things. Uh, we really welcome, uh, you know, uh, talking with you about that. Um, in terms of our meetings, we generally have uh, two, uh, one on general computing and another one uh, on data sciences. wanted to feature a couple of upcoming events. Um, the first one is uh, on Monday, January 25th. Um, this one is actually a noontime seminar, uh, Pacific time. And it's a panel discussion with senior data science recruiters. So um, if you have an interest in that area, whether you're um, someone who is hot, who wants to hire or is looking for um, work in that area, um, please check it out on um, our meetup and uh, uh, for more details. The second event is uh, with our um, partner, uh, it's the ACM SIGGRAPH. And on Thursday, January 28th, uh, they're having a meeting. Um, it's titled Silicon Valley ACM SIGGRAPH AI Driven Photorealistic Human Digitization by uh, Koki Nagano, uh, who was a senior research scientist at NVIDIA. And he's done a lot of uh, very interesting research on, um, on how to use facial expressions and package up the, the emotions of the entire person um, um, and making that experience available uh, to an audience. So um, that, that one's also gonna be very interesting. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over to our guest speaker. So Steve, let me uh, unshare and let's begin. Thank you very much, Michael, for the introduction. Great. All right, let me get to my screen. Okay. <clears throat> again, Michael, thank you uh, for the introduction and thank you to the SFACM organization for having me again. I'm looking forward uh, to talking to everyone a little bit tonight. Uh, again, my name is Steve Bachman. Uh, thank you again for joining the webinar. I'm, I've been a patent attorney for about 20 years here in Silicon Valley. Uh, I've worked at big law firms, smaller law firms, and I started my own law firm about five years ago. I work with clients in all sorts of different technical areas and fields, uh, hardware and software, although most of my work is in software. And then most of, a lot of that works actually in artificial intelligence. Uh, but I have years of experience counseling clients in all sorts of areas. Uh, in both U.S. patents and foreign patents, so I'm looking forward to sharing uh, some of that information with you tonight. So first, <clears throat> let me just kind of briefly go over what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about kind of IP 101, um, <clears throat> kind of what are some of the different types of IP, 
Uh, and what we're going to focus on tonight, which is mostly patents, but what some of the difference are, differences are between some different types of IP. Uh, and then patentability of software. So this is all about software tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, software protection in the US and in foreign countries, a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence software patentability, and what some of the, the different uh, rules are in different lo locales. Some strategies for efficiently trying to protect software. Um, there's definitely some different things that can be done to save time and money, uh, and some trade-offs with those different options. We're going to go into that. And then why, when, and where to file the software patent application. Well, that's where we'll really kind of get into the specific recommendations I have uh, for those that are considering filing. And then we'll save some time for questions at the end. Also, I believe uh, we have people standing by if you want to submit a question over the chat. Um, I'll check in with uh, some of the other uh, leaders and VIPs, Bill and Carl. If you want to keep an eye on the chat, uh, feel free to interrupt and speak up anytime if there are some questions. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to focus mostly on the slides. <clears throat> but if, if anybody has questions that you see come through the chat or is raising their hand, please bring it to my attention. I'll be happy to stop and address it. Okay. Okay. So first, let's talk about kind of different types of intellectual property. So there's a few different types uh, that is pretty much common to all different countries. There's patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. So a patent is a government granted right to prevent others from making, using, and selling or importing uh, an invention for a set period of time. So it's not an indefinite right. There's definitely a time limit for which you have that right. And it only prevents others from making, using, and selling and importing. Uh, it's granted in exchange for full public disclosure of, of uh, what your invention is, of what your innovation is. And that disclosure is made through a patent application that you file. And if you are granted a patent, your application becomes public. Uh, the intent is to provide a limited monopoly for a set period of time to encourage people to <clears throat> benefit from the work towards their innovation while still sharing it with the public so that once the patent expires, uh, other people can use it as well. So to be patentable, something must be new. There must not be anything like before, and it must not be obvious. Uh, the invention is described in a patent application, which includes drawings and a written description, and <clears throat> it includes claims which specify what can be excluded, uh, what you exclude others from doing. It can cover the way something works or the way something looks and there's provisional applications and non-provisional applications. We could talk for hours about uh, applications as well, uh, but I just wanted to provide a high level uh, <clears throat> description just so everyone has a general idea of what a patent is, although I suspect most of you do. A trademark, on the other hand, protects a brand of a particular product, the name of a product. So the name you associate with a service or a particular product or software. It can be a name, a symbol, uh, colors, it can even be sounds. Uh, it must be distinctive, it must not be generic. So you can't call, uh, <clears throat> for example, tissues, you can't call them tissue because that's just a generic name. Um, it must be something distinctive that kind of sets it apart and that when it's heard by others, they'll understand that that name is associated with your product. Copyright protection is also used to protect software. And what copyright protects is any original work of art. So if you create something like a picture or a drawing uh, or an essay <clears throat> or write a book or draft your original code, that is automatically protected by copyright. There's nothing you need to do. You don't need to submit to the US Patent Office or the Copyright Office. It's just automatically granted to you. Um, it protects original code and it's <clears throat> Uh, standard code is, is, however, not protectable. Like I said, what we're going to focus mostly today on is patents. So let's jump in now to the patentability of software. So we're going to talk about software patentability in the US, patentability in foreign countries, uh, because a global uh, patent strategy will include both of those. And then what are some efficient uh, ways to kind of manage those elements of your patent program. Hey, Steve? Yes. There was a, someone asked a question on the q and I okay. don't know that it fits here, but I just wanted to point that out. 
uh, what opportunities can an engineering student interested in patent law pursue? Uh, you might want to answer it later. I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll answer. Remind me of that one when we get to the end. <clears throat> okay. So, thank you. Okay. So for something to be patentable in the United States, it must meet three prime hurdles. Uh, must be new, must be novel, must not be anything just like it anywhere. It must be not obvious. So in light of everything that's out there, it must be more than an obvious step to come up with it uh, or to arrive at it based on what's the prior art that's already out there, uh, according to someone of ordinary skill in the art. And it must be patentable subject matter. Uh, so it must be a new and useful process, machine, manufacture or composition of matter um, or an improvement thereof. And the patentable subject matter uh, element is the, the, the prime hurdle for software. I mean, other than that, it has to be new and non-obvious like all other inventions, but the patentable subject matter is where the software patents uh, have, a little, um, <clears throat> have uh, some issues that they need to be, uh, they need to address in order to make it through the patent office and be a valid patent. Some of you may have heard that, uh, that keep track of uh, patent issues. Uh, there is a, a Supreme Court case called Alice Corp versus, versus CLS Bank. Uh, we won't go into the details too much, but basically um, software patents uh, can be considered an abstract idea. And if they are uh, determined to be an abstract idea, there's a two-part test to determine whether uh, <clears throat> it is an, an idea, and if it's patentable, then it must uh, amount to significantly more than an, an abstract idea. So claims directed towards a judicial exception to patentable subject matter, uh, such as, for example, an abstract idea, um, then the claim terms must transform the nature of the claim to something significantly more. So what is significantly more? Well, it basically has to be tied to the tech to technology in some way. So it must be a technology or the claims must be rooted in computer technology. What does that mean? Uh, it means that the, the claims must be related to something that wouldn't exist but for technology, such as encryption or video image processing, um, so something like that, that <clears throat> uh, computers uh, are a technology that is inherently related to a computing device. Um, is also significantly more if it improves computer operations. So if it saves memory or makes processors uh, operate more efficiently. Um, if an automated process differs from a, a manual process, so if it's done differently when it's automated by a computer, then that's uh, potentially a significantly more, uh, as well as if it's a non-conventional arrangement of known pieces. So th the takeaway is for, for, for software to be patentable, it needs to basically be tied to a computer or rooted in technology uh, in that <clears throat> uh, it solves a, a technical problem with a technical solution. So now look, talking, we're gonna move on to what's uh, patentable software outside the US. And if there's only one thing you take away from this uh, presentation, it's this rule that I'm gonna talk about right now. So once, if you have an invention, if, let's say if you come up with some amazing software or any other innovation that you wanna patent, uh, do not make it public and do not offer it for sale if you want to file it in foreign countries. So if you do offer your uh, software for sale or, or um, you know, put it on the web and make it freely available or and somehow publicize, you know, make it public what you're doing, uh, in the US, it triggers a 12 month period in which you can submit a patent application. So in the US, as long as you submit an application within 12 months, you can protect it. However, the US is a first to file uh, jurisdiction. So if somebody else beats you to the patent office, they might get the rights to it before you do. So you probably wanna submit it if you wanna protect it very soon after you publicize it. However, in foreign countries, once something is made public it, for anywhere in the world, it's not patentable in many foreign countries, including Europe, China, and Japan. So if you disclose something, uh, if you disclose your software, make sure you file a, a provisional application or some application, whether through the PCT process or in the US or in some country that you're 
allowed to file in before you make it public or else you're going to lose all your foreign uh, patent rights. So is, patent, is software patentable in foreign countries? Yes, it is, but it's definitely easier in some countries uh, compared to others. So Japan has a lower standard for software patentability. It's, it's similar to that in the US, uh, but it actually might even be a little bit easier. In Europe, it is a bit more difficult to patent software. It's still patentable. I've obtained uh, numerous software patents in Europe, but uh, there are some additional requirements, which are kind of like the US uh, requirements, but a little bit more stringent. So it must have the, a, a claimed software and invention to be patentable in Europe, it must have technical character and it must provide a further technical effect. So technical character means you must tie it to a machine similar to the US. So it has to be on a device or a method operated uh, implemented by a computer. So as long as your claim or at least your specification indicates that uh, your software is performed on a particular type of device or how it runs on a computer, uh, then that uh, <clears throat> hurdle can be met. And then providing further technical effect, you must, in, you must show what uh, technical problem your software is serving. So does it uh, you know, speed up encryption? Does it make uh, an application run smoother or quicker? Uh, does it uh, you know, manage data better, save memory, something like that? Um, those are some requirements for Europe. China is similar to Europe in, in requiring the technical feature and the technical character aspect. So software is patentable outside the US. There's different levels of requirements to meet, but it's definitely patentable. And now let's uh, touch base on artificial intelligence real quick. So the patentability of software to, for an artificial intelligence, such as machine learning or neural network or deep network uh, implementation has some of the same issues as software in general and that subject matter eligibility is an issue. So it must be something that is patentable. So for example, uh, it must, be tied to a machine, um, you know, rooted in uh, computer technology and so forth. Also, one aspect that's unique to artificial intelligence is inventorship. So who conceived of the claimed invention? Um, <clears throat> Eve? Yes. Uh, there is a question also, uh, can you patent machine learning algorithms and techniques? Uh, well, that's a very good timing. Let's uh, let's see if when we go through the next slides, uh, I'll address that question again. Um, so for uh, for something to be patentable, the inventor has to be a person. So only something generated or conceived of by a person uh, can be patentable. So if something is uh, invented or conceived of, you know, in, or generated or conceived of by a machine, it's not patentable because only an inventor uh, as a live person can be, <clears throat> uh, can be granted a patent. So where does that leave us? What is patentable artificial intelligence? So if you have, um, you know, a training model that's modified by someone, by, the, by a human inventor, or, you know, algorithms or models that are modified by people, <clears throat> um, or the application of uh, a model output, that's, those are all things that could potentially be patentable, but the raw output of a machine learning model is not patentable. So to uh, circle back to that question, uh, could an artificial intelligence algorithm or model or machine be patentable? Potentially, um, if, if one, one thing you have to be, be careful of is that uh, if you're using open source components, you wanna make sure you're complying with all the license terms uh, because a lot of open source uh, licenses require that you don't patent uh, the, the software that you're incorporating their code into, as well as in some cases code that that open source component communicates with. Um, but could potentially uh, algorithms and models uh, be patented? Potentially, <clears throat> yes. A pure algorithm is not patentable, but you know an algorithm. If you if you phrase it as you know this is an algorithm that receives this input and provides this output and this that other output, you know, describe the application of the algorithm output, then it could potentially be patentable. Um, I'm not sure who asked the question, but I encourage them if they had a specific instance they had a question about to 
uh, get in touch with me sometime after the presentation and I'd be happy to talk to them over the phone. So uh, the patentability of, of artificial intelligence software in other countries, it basically follows the same uh, patterns as software patentability in general. Um, the invention, for example, in Europe, which I have here as an example, uh, EPO inventions must have technical character and provide a technical solution. And they do specifically hold that uh, pure artificial intelligence and machine learning computational models are abstract in nature and not patentable. So what you have to do is if you have you know, a computational model, you have to tie it to a machine and indicate what the technical solution is, basically what the output or the application is that it performs. So that was a little bit, that was a lot of background information about patentability. So now let's kind of dive into the meat of this presentation. Uh, how do you efficiently protect software uh, in the US and uh, globally? So there's a couple of different tools for, or methodologies for, uh, protecting software in foreign countries. It's for two of the most common are the PCT application and a direct national application. So in a PCT application, which we'll get to more in a second, you basically, you file a single application, which then you can have um, applied to multiple other countries uh, at a later date. So if you, you file one placeholder application, then you can nationalize that application in several other countries that you select at a later time. A direct national application is a single application that you file one at a time whenever you're ready to patent something. For example, if you just want to file something in France, you just directly file in France. If you just want to directly file an application in Taiwan, you just directly file an application in Taiwan. Uh, there's uh, benefits and drawbacks to each one. Let's take a closer look. So in the, the PCT process, which stands for the Patent Cooperation Treaty, uh, an initial PCT application is filed first in what's called the receiving office. That's a member of the PCT um, treaty. Uh, one of the receiving offices just happens to be the US Patent Office. And then once that application is filed, there's going to be an, uh, uh, <clears throat> an examination uh, before you have to decide which application, which countries you want to nationalize that application in. And that's helpful because you don't spend the money going, uh, you know, submitting that uh, application into foreign countries until after you've already kind of seen the first round of examination. So if it comes, if the, that first uh, examination before the national application filings comes back pretty, uh, you know, if it looks hopeful, if it looks promising, then you can, you, you might feel more confident about moving forward with some of the national applications. If there's a lot of prior art and it, it's, <clears throat> it's not looking like there will be as clear a path as you thought, uh, to get something patentable based on that first examination, you can modify the claims or just decide to abandon that PCT application, not move forward with those national applications and thereby save a lot of money. Um, so as I mentioned, once you file that first PCT application, the national applications and those national applications where you decide which are the eventual countries you want to move forward in, you don't need to decide that until 30 or 31 months from the earliest priority date. So for example, if you just file a PCT application uh, based on no other application, your priority date is as of when you file a PCT application. You do have an option to file a PCT application within 12 months of another application that you've filed, for example, in the US. So if you filed a US application and then within 12 months filed a PCT application, then you would select your national applications at 30 or 31 months. Um, another benefit of going through the PCT, but I guess you could do in, in direct fines as well, is that there you can file in the EU um, through the, the EPO. Uh, <clears throat> and as I mentioned, you can select which countries to apply to at a much later date, which uh, allows you to push off some of the, the financial burdens of associated with patent applications uh, until maybe your company is up and running and has some traction. With direct national patent applications, the filing fees are due immediately. So you're immediately filing the application. And so the filing fees, which are often uh, a big chunk of the cost of doing of filing for patents are due right up front. 
the exam, one good part though, is the examination begins soon after the filing. So soon after you, as uh, soon as you file it, you're in the queue to be examined. Uh, you will likely obtain a patent from a desired country much quicker if you directly file that application than the PCT process, because through the PCT process, you typically you, you have the option to wait, and most people do, till about three months, I'm sorry, 30 months, about two and a half years after your earliest priority date. So just to kind of put it all in a picture, uh, <clears throat> most of the money spent in whether you go piece through the PCT or direct national filings, it's gonna come when you do the national filings. Uh, sorry for the typo, I meant to do country one, two, three, instead of country one, country one, country one. But basically you can see that with the direct national filings, you're, you're filing right up front. Uh, you, know, with, you can see that the timeline is kind of on the bottom. And so all the money is uh, early on in the process for the, a lot of the, the big chunks of the money is early on the process for direct national filings. In the PCT process, you might file a US patent application first, and then file PCT filing within 12 months of the US patent application. And then 30 months from the US patent filing, file the, the different country national filings. So your big money isn't gonna be due till later in the PCT process, as opposed to the direct national filings. There is some dollars up front for the US patent filing though, isn't there? There is some, but it's, <clears throat> it's going to, uh, it's not gonna be as much uh, you know, you're probably looking at, you know, somewhere between 5,000 to 15,000, maybe 20,000 per application, depending on, you know, the firm you go with, as opposed to, uh, you know, 50,000 or 60,000 if you're going with more than one country. So it, it's going to be, you know, if mo when most people file in foreign countries, they usually go with more than one country. For example, they'll go with uh, Europe, the EU, the, you know, the European Union, maybe Japan and China. So those three will cost probably $30,000, maybe $40,000 uh, by the time everything is said and done, just for the filing. A US patent application filing costs you know, between five and 15,000 usually. Um, <clears throat> so through the PCT process, you can postpone that 30 to $40,000 out for two and a half years, as opposed to doing it at the same time as the US patent filing or just doing it immediately. Uh, Steve? Yes. Question. Uh, when you talk about the filing outside of the U.S., uh, is that the fee include language translation? Is that required to use the local language to do the filing? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> we're going to get to that a little bit later, but for many foreign countries, if English is not one of their primary languages, in addition to filing the patent application and doing the paperwork and filing or paying foreign counsel to handle those matters locally for you, you'll have to pay for a translation. Uh, these foreign counsel, uh, these foreign law firms will tell them that they strongly recommend that they use their uh, translation people because they are trusted uh, and <clears throat> familiar with doing technology-based translations. Uh, but it is an option to try and have a translation done, you know, uh, ahead of time by someone else that you choose and maybe shop around for. You could potentially get it done cheaper. Uh, but if they're not familiar with, you know, the particular technical aspects of your innovation, as well as the legal aspects that are kind of, uh, you know, used in the patent application, there's uh, always the chance that, you know, the translation won't be entirely accurate. But uh, having a translation done for a country that requires it, uh, having that translation done yourself, you know, locally or, you know, with, with someone that you choose could oftentimes be cheaper than uh, having a translation done by a, a law firm overseas who's going to file the application. So uh, the, when you say foreign patent filings uh, around $50,000 per application, is that including the translation cost or, or not? So <clears throat> filing in different countries, the cost varies. For example, Canada is cheap, is one of the cheaper ones because they are in English, uh, you know, they deal with English uh, and their, their patent law is similar to US patent law. Um, China 
and Japan and the European Union are more expensive because they require translations because their uh, you know, default language is not English. Um, it's certainly not 50,000 each to apply. Uh, I, I, Canada is usually somewhere between three to 4,000, generally speaking. I mean, it depends on the application and how long it is and uh, things like that. Uh, how many inventors there are, how many claims there are. Um, China, Japan, European Union, and most other countries that require translation are between uh, 7,000 to eight or 9,000 typically charged by a law a foreign law firm, um, <clears throat> including the translation costs, including the initial filing, including uh, adjusting the application to uh, conform with their uh, their country's patent rules, including doing, you know, an assignment uh, that's, uh, you know, acceptable by their patent office and such. So, and that's just for the initial filing. Typically, I tell my clients that they should expect to spend uh, between twenty-five ,000 to thirty-five thousand per country that they're filing a, a foreign patent application in and expect to pay that, that amount, that 25 to 35,000 over the course of three to five years. Tom um, asked a question. Okay. Oh, sorry, Liana, what, did you want to follow up? No, no, I'm, I'm okay now. Tom asked, uh, PCT leaves you in patent applied for, but not yet patented for longer. Isn't that a problem? Um, yeah, you cannot enforce a patent until it's issued. Uh, so like I said, going for a direct national filing is going to get you, has the potential to get you a patent much quicker than going through the PCT process. But if, you know, if some of these foreign countries are gonna cost eight or 9,000 each and you wanna go and you wanna file in four or five of them, uh, you know, maybe you have 40 to 50,000 to do that with, maybe you don't. So. Yes, you can say it's, it, yes, if going through the PCT process, uh, it's gonna be patent pending uh, for a longer period of time, but at least you can afford to, to make those filings and you don't have to come up with the money up front. It's just, it's a business decision for, for each company based on where they're at. All right, good, all very good questions. Let's continue on. So another way to efficiently protect software and any other type of innovation is through continuation applications. So a continuation application is kind of like refiling your application, but claiming something else that you talked about in your application, but the claims didn't address. So when you file a patent application, you have your drawings and you have your specification. And the specification describes all these things in your patent application. And then the claims, um, address a part of it here, maybe you know, a, a, a different part of it, you know, a particular implementation, and then you get your patent and that's great. But what if you want to uh, claim a different part of it? For example, uh, some many patents will describe an invention as you know, a method performed on a computer or the computer itself or code stored on a computer readable medium such as a flash drive or, um, you know, a, a CD disc. Oftentimes the, the patent office will make you choose, you have to, uh, between those three types of claims, those three types of things you want to protect, either the method, whoops, sorry, or the system, or the computer readable medium. So if you get the, the method patents, then you might want to go back and get a continuation on the system continuation. I'm sorry, get, go back and file a continuation on the system claims. Um, <clears throat> in any case, uh, filing a continuation can be much cheaper than filing an original patent application. So you can get multiple patents on your inventions uh, by basically refiling the application with the same drawings, the same written description, but basically different claims. Uh, you can't add any new content. The claims have to be supported by the specification that you originally filed. Um, and there could be several reasons to file a continuation uh, patent application. One is <clears throat> to keep an application alive. Uh, so to, to maybe cover a future infringer or look uh, attractive to a future acquisition, 
or just have a shield against a future uh, litigious competitor. Um, and the way that I've seen companies and I've helped them do this is when they get a patent that's just about to be allowed, they file a continuation on something else. And they say, well, we're glad we got this patent, but this other competitor, you know, they've, <clears throat> We uh, just ended a joint development agreement. We think they're going to you know, go off and kind of copy this. So we want to make sure we're protected uh, with you know, what we shared with them. Is there anything that we share with them that's covered in this patent that, that, we've, uh, you know, that we just got some claims on that we can file a continuation in? So you can file you know, a new set of claims that cover something in that joint development agreement um, to kind of <clears throat> help prevent that uh, joint developer from you know, taking your IP at a later time. Um, the only, one of the drawbacks of continuation application is you are limited to what was in the original filed application. So if you want to add something to it, that would be considered a continuation in part. So you're continuing the application you already filed, but you're also adding some things to it. So <clears throat> the part, the portion of the uh, application that is a direct continuation from the prior application and that everything that the prior application in that new application has the priority date of the prior application. Things you're adding to that continuation and part application that were not in the previous application have a priority date as of when you filed the application. So, We've gone over a lot of things. Uh, I've gone over a lot of rules and such. Here's just some general takeaways for efficient software protection. Uh, if, if you're gonna file in two or more countries, uh, foreign countries, it probably makes sense to do the PCT process uh, unless you need patents right away. So if you're willing to wait a little bit and you want to postpone the cost a little bit, uh, most companies find that it makes um, economic sense and business sense to file PCT application initially and then uh, confirm which countries you wanna move forward in later. Um, if possible, uh, by all means, try and do a continuation or a divisional or at least a CIP of a previous application just so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to draft up a whole new patent application and, uh, <clears throat> and incur the cost of a new application but rather just uh, move forward with the continuation application, which is often just a fraction of the cost of a new application. There's also something called the Patent Prosecution Highway or PPH. So if you get allowed subject matter in a patent application here in the US, uh, there's other countries that will kind of recognize that and kind of fast track an application in their own country based on what's allowed uh, in the US. Uh, these companies or countries include Australia, Canada, Finland, Japan, and Korea and China. Um, one requirement is that the claims in these applications need to be very similar to what was allowed in the US. Uh, they can always be amended to be uh, similar, but this can be, this can save prosecution costs, uh, attorney costs, costs all over the place. Uh, if you get allowed subject matter in the U.S. and you want to try and fast track it in some of these other countries. Okay, um, I'm going to take a quick drink while just asking, is there any other questions right now? If not, let's keep going. So <clears throat> now we're going to get into some more specifics as to uh, kind of the details of why should I file a software patent anywhere? When should I file it and where should I file it? These are some of the questions I get most often uh, from all, all sizes of clients, all types of clients. So why should I file a patent? Well, a patent helps attract investment. If you're a company that's looking for investment, saying you have uh, your, your latest product is patent pending or that you have an IP plan in place always looks good to uh, a VC or an investor. Um, the traditional reason to have an application is could prevent theft of innovations. So whether you kind of use it as a, you know, carrying around a big sword, not that you'd want to use it to kind of help joint developers, uh, you know, stay in place or uh, people you license it to, um, or just an infringer in the market, uh, the patent or just uh, even patent pending can help prevent theft of innovations. It can also help you avoid litigation. So I don't think there's a company anywhere, uh, even, <clears throat> uh, even Apple and Samsung that want to do patent litigation. 
Uh, it's expensive. It's time consuming. You know, 90% of the fees just go to the, to the attorneys. Uh, it's, it's expensive and uh, just not desirable. And I guarantee you that when anyone, just any company decides they're gonna sue a patent application or sue a company for patent infringement, the first thing their attorneys do is look up what patents or patent applications that the potential defendant has. And so if your company has patents, uh, they know that they're probably gonna be cross asserted against uh, their own company who's about to file against the company that has the patents. And it's either gonna make them think twice or at least uh, make uh, give the, the defendant a lot more leverage in uh, discussions to, to settle uh, before uh, the patent uh, litigation gets too far. Another reason why to file patents is that companies that tend to file for original patents for technology that they develop in-house tend to be more successful. Uh, they have a lot more employment growth, they have sales growth, uh, more likely to get funding and more likely to be listed on the stock exchange at some point. <clears throat> and that comes from, from Harvard. And I, <laughs> so I think they would know, uh, at least it sounds good to me. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about why to file a patent, when you should file a patent. There's probably just as many reasons why you should not file a patent. Um, and if you don't file a patent, one very good option is a trade secret protection. Uh, for example, if your software is difficult to detect if somebody else is infringing it, then you may not want to do it. So <clears throat> one uh, music app I listen to on my computer is Pandora. And I don't think they've ever filed patent applications on their algorithms for selecting music because they'd never, never really be able to detect if somebody else is doing it. So they just uh, keep it as a trade secret. Um, if reverse engineering would be difficult to achieve, uh, then that's a reason why not to do it. Patent applications last 19 years from the date you file for the patent. So if you file for a patent, let's say in 2020, uh, you get your patent in any year, uh, let's say in two years, then your patent will be valid uh, as long as you pay maintenance fees once it's issued through 30, I'm sorry, 2039. So if you have technology that you think is going to be important and useful and give you a competitive edge through 2050, you know, 10 years past when the patent would uh, expire, then it doesn't make sense to get a patent because everything, you're only going to get a patent on it if you describe it. And if everybody's going to be doing it in 10 years where you could keep it a secret and you'd be the only one that would have it for 20 years, then you wouldn't want to file a patent. Also, sometimes if the innovation is just not aligned with business goals. So it may be uh, an amazing technology. It's really useful. It helps something at your company, but it's not really core to your technology. Uh, it's not uh, along the roadmap of where it's going to help you, your company get to where they want to be. Um, then something they might just want to sell, but probably not spend money trying to patent. So when should a company file for a patent? <clears throat> Two to three months before obtaining VC funding, just so when you do start attend, uh, trying to get VC funding, you can say it's patent pending, um, before disclosing the technology or making a contract or offering it for sale. Uh, because once you disclose it or offer it for sale, it's not gonna be patentable in foreign countries. Um, or if you think your company is really gonna do doing well, if you're gonna be a disruptor, which you know many companies think they are, uh, if you think you're going to be taking away competitor market share in the next one to two years, you should probably start filing for patents because it takes a, a year or two to get a patent. And if you take away another competitor's market share, they might start coming after you. So you'll want something to uh, cross license them so you can settle. So we're running, we're getting close to the end of this. I have just a few more slides. So I'm going to start going through these a little bit more quickly. Uh, what do you want to patent? Uh, <clears throat> Each company, it's you know, wants, probably wants to make that decision for themselves. You know, what would I want to patent? You know, what's core to us? Um, what's valuable? What's not valuable? But generally speaking, if something is valuable and very likely patentable, that should be maybe a high priority uh, candidate for patent protection. It's, if something is less likely to be patentable or less valuable, then you want to make it a low pro priority uh, candidate for patent protection or potentially just uh, donate it to open source. And then once you have all your ranked candidates, then you can kind of um, approach those from the point of view as, 
you know, this is our budget. This is, you know, this is the patent portfolio or part of the IP portfolio we want to achieve. You know, if we do move forward with patents, we'll start with these at the top and move downward. <clears throat> All right, so where should you file? This is when people look at foreign countries, a lot of times they get very excited. I just want to file it everywhere. I have a great product or they just have no idea where they want to. Uh, move forward with patent protection. So there's a few factors that I, I have them consider and just determine, you know, the more factors that apply to a particular country, uh, the more strongly they should consider that country. So the first one is revenue. Um, how much revenue are you making from that country? Uh, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't make much sense to have a patent uh, if, nobody's, uh, if nobody's really in a particular country like Germany, if nobody's buying your, your product in Germany it's kind of be, going to be a worthless patent. So you want to make sure the revenue from the innovation to be patented is above some threshold amount. Uh, what that threshold amount is uh, kind of varies uh, between companies, um, you know, what their comfort level is, you know, maybe what their, <clears throat> uh, how aggressive they're willing to be with patent infringement. Um, I have some other factors to consider here with, that I do with my uh, clients, but it, it basically differs per company. Another factor to consider is whether the, whether the innovative technology is licensed to an entity in the foreign country. So it's, do you license someone else to sell it on your behalf or sell it as a service? Or are they using it or at least the technical know-how? Um, if you're licensing it to someone, then they basically have it. And you wanna make sure if they stop paying the fees that you can sue them to, uh, to make them stop. If you have a partner, in this, the software in a foreign country, then that's, that's a factor you may want to consider as well. In particular, if you have software developers, whether they're in India or the Ukraine or Ireland or anywhere else, uh, it might be a good idea to file for patent protection there just to make sure that they don't <clears throat> break off and start their own company and become a competitor. And then finally, if you want to be acquired by a company that, uh, in a foreign country, sorry about that, uh, then that's a, a um, a a, that's a country you should consider as well. For example, if you're if you deal in software for uh, mobile phones, uh, you now Apple is here in the U.S., but Nokia is in Korea. So you may want to consider filing a uh, patent application in Korea just to look attractive to Korea, um, or you may want to file <clears throat> you know wherever Samsung does a lot of business, you know wherever uh, a potential uh, um, acquisition company may be from is where you might want to consider uh, filing, uh, you know, a patent application in that country. So revenue, uh, any country where you're getting a significant amount of rent revenue, uh, anywhere you're licensing others, something about the software, where you have a partner for developing the software or some other partner in the basic business aspect of uh, that software, or if you want to be acquired by a company in a particular foreign country, these are factors that you should consider when you're deciding where to file your patent application. So I know that was a lot of information. Um, I hope it was helpful. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts? So there are some questions in the Q&A section. I don't know that all of them have been address, uh, addressed yet. Uh, there was that one back at the uh, beginning where um, Yuka asked, what opportunities can an engineering student interested in patent law pursue, such as internships or research, et cetera? Got it. So I have the, the Q&A open now. So let me go through these as, uh, as I can. <clears throat> so what opportunities can an engineering student interested in patent law pursue? Well, you can work for the patent office, uh, either the US patent office or maybe even a foreign patent office. Um, you could work at a law firm. Uh, a lot of law firms will hire engineering students as uh, technical specialists. And that's kind of like an internship to kind of get their feet wet into patent prosecution and see if it's a mutual fit. Um, so if you're interested in that, I would suggest reaching out to some of the bigger law firms like Morrison Forrester or Fenwick and West <laughs> to see if they have any uh, options for an engineering student. Uh, next question, can, can you patent machine learning algorithms and technologies? 
uh, machine learning technology is definitely ex what's most patentable about uh, AI technology is an application of the output of an algorithm or model. You cannot patent a pure algorithm, um, but you can generally patent uh, like the application of an output. So you would, the, the, the claim might or the protection might cover something like uh, you know, receiving so and so data to generate you know, some, uh, you know, estimation and then applying that estimation towards, you know, this function. Uh, Yuka, if you have further questions about that, please feel free to reach out. Tom, uh, <clears throat> PCT leaves you in patent applied for, but yet patented for longer. Uh, isn't that a problem? It can be, it depends on the company. Uh, but yes, that's gonna, from a time point of view, the PCT process is generally gonna take longer to get a patent application than filing directly. Uh, you could then ask if you're a small independent inventor, is it worth getting a patent? Um, I would say it, <clears throat> get, it, it makes sense. I, I provided some uh, factors to consider if, you know, should you file for patent? If you have the company uh, that's looking for funding, you know, if then I'd say probably so. If you're a small independent inventor, you got to really decide what am I really going to do if I have this patent? You know, I have this idea, but do I really have a product? Do I really have you know, like a, a sales plan? Do I have a marketing plan? Do I have an incorporation plan? Uh, if you just, you know, are a small independent venture and you just have an idea, it's worth getting a patent? Maybe not. And I've actually tried um, to talk some small inventors out of by, out of moving forward the patent because it's an expensive process. It's a process that takes a long time, like two to three years, often is the, the time it takes to get a patent. And then all that does is prevent you, allow you to prevent someone else from making use of it or selling it if you file a lawsuit against them, which often costs between 200,000 to two or $3 million. Uh, they call patent litigation the game of kings. So if you're a small independent inventor, uh, if you're just asking, is it worth to get a patent uh, with no other context, I'd say probably not. Um, a small independent inventor who uh, has a very clear vision of a company <clears throat> with a marketing plan, uh, growth plan, investment plan, uh, such as that, may, to them, maybe it might be worth getting a patent. Greg asks, what about patenting in India? Is part of your software company is India, but not many customers? Um, if your software company is in India, but you don't have any customers there, then you, one of the factors is you, do you have partners there that are doing your developing? Uh, if, if, so for example, if you have partners that are developing your, your uh, technology in India, but not many customers, it's something you should think about. One thing to also kind of balance it with is how you know, reputable is your developing company or the people you work with? Um, if a particular development company overseas uh, had a history of, or even just once or once in the past, had a history of ripping off an invention and selling it or going forward on their own, that'd be the end of their business. So most reputable software development countries, software development countries overseas are probably going to be okay uh, in honoring, you know, contracts alone as far as not uh, giving away your valuable IP, but it's something to consider. Um, I wish it was a black and white answer, but it's just not. If you, Greg, if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to me by email. <clears throat> um, Greg has another one. If you want to protect from other software developers in India, um, so you, if, you, if you want to protect from other software developers in India, I'm not sure what that means. So if you, <clears throat> If, if, if you're afraid that one software developer is going to give to another software developer or? I, I think uh, I'm guessing that it means that uh, if you have a software developer that you are uh, employing in India uh, and you want to protect from other people that you're not employing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> then then that, I, I, I know it sounds like you have a concern uh, that you, you don't completely trust your, your software is gonna stay with that developer in India. Uh, so in that case, I would probably strong, I would strongly consider filing in India. Um, and then Tom asks, if someone refuses to license or patent to you, do you have any recourse? No, if there's a patent. 
Uh, so if, <laughs> if you want, if somebody has a patent on something and they don't want to license it to you, uh, <clears throat> you don't have a legal right to practice it because the, the owner of that patent has a right to exclude anybody else. Um, would they actually come after you? That's another, um, that's another issue. But if you willingly infringe a patent that you're aware of, you could be awarded triple the damages that uh, they would actually suffer. So if you profit, let's say five cents a unit or you know, $1,000 a month, they could actually sue you for 15 cents a unit or 3,000 a month uh, if you know there's a patent and you know you're infringing it willingly. All right, Greg's got a, a Greg's got a good one now. I thought in the 80s, Boston University's Cognitive and Neural Systems, uh, Grossberg and Carpenter, patented the ART and ART2 neural network algorithms. This is a comment. So back in the 80s, they might have done that, but software patents have uh, <clears throat> been scrutinized since then. And the US Supreme Court came up with that Alice test. So just be, if someone gets a patent, uh, let's say 10 years ago, and the rules, let's say they've changed five years ago to make it so what they got let's, might be a bogus patent at this point. They're not going to go back and check all the patents and say, okay, this patent's not good anymore. That other patent's not good anymore. Um, what would happen is if they wanted to assert the, the patented art or art two patents against someone, then the defendant would say, well, these aren't valid patents anymore based on the new rules uh, that's required for patentability. And then those patents would be tossed out. So they may have well um, uh, you know, obtained patents on ART and ART2 uh, algorithms, but based on new patent rules, those patents are invalid. So if they tried to enforce them against anyone, they would be invalidated. And then Greg's got another, he's, Greg is uh, live typing us. Part of the company is in the USA, part in India for software development. <clears throat> uh, Greg, it, <clears throat> I, it sounds like you have concerns. Um, I'd say let's talk over the phone, maybe sometime later this week or probably next week. But overall, I'd say uh, if, if, if you have a partner and you want to keep them honest, or if you think there's going to be infringement and you want to stop that infringement, then you should file in India. So those, there's the Q&A. <clears throat> if there's no other questions, I'm happy to stay on for a little bit, but I just wanted okay. to say thank you very much to everyone for staying on. And Steve, uh, yeah. Can I, you know, um, the same questions that were asked just now about India, uh, would it be reasonable to ask those about China? <clears throat> I mean, uh, you know, that's another large country where we do a lot of tech of uh, development, or we have share. We share. Um, there, there are there are companies here that share a lot of technology with uh, China. Yes, um, <clears throat> there are. Um, so, so yeah, China is another good question as far as. Uh, just to make sense of file in China. So 15, 20 years ago, most people would have told you, no, uh, don't file in China because A, you're probably not gonna get an application and uh, into a patent. And if you do, you're not gonna be able to enforce it. Lately though, uh, because China wants, wants to be seen as a more globally respected and recognized power. <clears throat> and part of that is because they need a respected IP system. They've been doing a much better job of being fair in granting patents and enforcing patents. So again, if any of these factors apply, like you wanna be acquired by a Chinese company or you have a partnership team in China, or you're just afraid that word's gonna get out in China uh, by competitors and you wanna protect them, then China is by all means a uh, reasonable place to consider filing for patent protection. Um, <clears throat> it's yeah, a much I more, uh, th th their, their patent, uh, grant and enforcement has a lot more integrity now than it did before. Okay, so it, it's good to hear, um, you know, you, it, it's, it's, uh, it's valuable um, knowledge that you have of specific uh, countries, their situations, like you were just talking about with China. I guess my, my point was that Greg, you know, had asked, uh, specifically about India, but the, the question I think could be asked about any uh, country, 
you know, where you have an offshore development team and you're concerned about the, um, you don't want the core technology that was perhaps developed in the United States to get out in the wild, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm, I, I'm, uh, I can't turn on Greg's speaker. I would love to do that, but I can't do that to uh, have him ask the question himself. So I'll just- That's okay. To... But yes, I agree with you. The, 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 the fact scenario could apply to any country. It could be India, China, Ireland, uh, anywhere. And then kind of the same reasoning would apply. Um, you know, <clears throat> is, it a, is it a country that honors and withholds, you know, a reasonably high integrity patent system? In most cases, yes. Uh, and then you just kind of go to the factors that I laid out previously. Um, do, you, do you have somebody that's a partner there? Yes. Is there a, a, a potential of infringement there? Yes. Is there, if they do infringe, how much revenue are they going to make? So one, one thing to consider with the revenue uh, prong is <clears throat> patent litigation is expensive, especially when you're paying lawyers here to deal with lawyers in another country. I mean, that's like every, every communication, you know, is, is going to be, have a lot of, uh, you know, attorney hands on it. Um, patent litigation in a foreign country is probably going to cost at least two to $3 million. So, you know, if, if it is infringed, but they're only going to, you know, get maybe a hundred thousand in revenue, maybe just let it go. You know, if they're going to infringe and make four or 5 million on it, well, then maybe it's something that's worth spending 2 million to, to, to stop and get that revenue back. You know, you don't want to spend 2 million in revenue to win a hundred thousand dollars. Yep. Always a judgment call. And then there was one other question that was added here in the Q and a, which was uh, what different work do you do as an attorney versus a, pat, a patent agent? I guess actually there were two questions here. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Sounds like Yuka is definitely looking for the options of becoming a patent attorney versus a patent agent. Uh, an, attor an attorney has passed a state bar uh, and a patent attorney has passed a state bar and the US patent office bar. A patent agent has only passed the patent bar. Um, so a patent agent and a US, uh, I'm sorry, and a patent attorney can um, file patents, uh, you know, prepare and file patents on behalf of somebody else. Anybody can file their own patent uh, in, in their own name, but to do it for somebody else, you have to be either a patent agent or a patent attorney. To litigate a patent case, you must be an attorney. And to advise on law, such as uh, patent law, contract law, uh, trademark law and such forth, uh, you need to be an attorney. As a patent agent, you can prepare patent applications and file them on behalf of other people, but you cannot, cannot advise on uh, IP law. Okay, and then Tom uh, Moran put one more thing down here in the, in the Q&A as a comment where he says, uh, if you don't trust your Ukrainian colleagues, um, should you patent in Ukraine, likely someone who uses your invention will be selling in more than just Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes, because, you know, software, I guess the, where you'd want to focus, if, if you have Ukrainian colleagues you don't trust, then you'd want a patent wherever they're headquartered. So um, wherever they, regardless of who they sell to, wherever they are is where you'd want to bring the lawsuit. And you're right. Uh, they could be, they could sell it to someone else or they could, you know, other people get and sell. I mean, a lot of times you just need to do some business uh, strategy to determine who uh, is going to infringe it, where they might be, uh, and you know what's what's the potential uh, reward as opposed to the cost to stop them? Okay, I think we. I have one one question. Oh, Karthik, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Is there any different? Think. Yeah, difference between individual pattern versus a company like. Uh, person working for a company filing a pattern versus 
uh, this individual effort cost wise uh, uh, process wise is there any difference or all in the same i'm, I'm sorry can you repeat that question the, the the cost and process wise between doing what two things no uh, as an individual a person filing your patent versus uh -huh. the person working in a company and uh, filing a patent okay um the main so there's going to be two differences one is who pays for it so if you work at a company uh the company is probably going to pay the cost of preparing the patent application responding to the examination of documents with the patent office and all the other costs associated with it and they're going to own it <clears throat> uh that the, the other part is who owns the application uh so if you're with a company you probably signed an employment agreement that may have included a specific IP assignment clause, um, or there was like an implied clause, uh, some sort of assignment that any of your IP uh, that you come up with during the course of your employment with them is gonna be uh, owned by the company. So as far as costs, it, there's not gonna be a really change in costs. It's just gonna be who pays for it. And then as far as ownership, if you come up with it on your own, then you own that uh, patent. If you come up with it through the course of working for a company and it's in their line of business, then the company is going to own it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did, did I hear any more questions? Okay. Thank you, uh, Stephen. You're very welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we'll keep uh, keep your line open and uh, see who else have questions coming up. Sounds <laughs> good. Thank you all again and have a good evening. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and for your good questions as well. Okay. okay. Yep. Bye then. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.